coming up on today's episode of the Salesman Podcast. Because I saw so many people, you know, they have, they work very hard, you know, they want to be writers or whatever, or salesmen, I don't know, they want to achieve a goal, but they never get there. Like, you know, you see them like a year later, two years later, five years later, like, it's driving me crazy. I'm like, what are you doing? I just you need to understand how it works. You know, I think we just, the brain is not designed to be able to, I guess, uh, process a factor that we need to think of to succeed. We don't know many things we don't know about reality and what's going to happen in the future. So, and also it's a way, I guess, to, it's a good thing because maybe if you knew beforehand what you have to do to succeed, you will not get there. You will not start. <laughs> Hello, Sales Nation. My name is Will Barrett, and I'm the host of the Salesman Podcast, the world's most downloaded B2B sales show. On today's episode, we have Tebow. He is the author of Master Your Thinking, which you can find on Amazon. And on today's episode, that's what we'll get into, Master Your Thinking, how to control your assumptions, how to avoid falling into the pitfalls of cognitive biases, and how to deal with someone when they are genuinely delusional when they're not living in an appropriate reality to do business with them but you've got to get the deal done you've got to sign those contracts with these individuals to get our commission payments so how to deal with those folks and a whole lot more everything we talk about is available in the show notes of this episode over at salesman.org and so with that said let's jump right into it I think we're going to start to talk about uh, how to master the way that we can think and then we might end up on emotions, focus or one of the other books and many amounts of, of I guess, like self, uh, self-improvement self content that you have in your mastery uh, book series. And there's tons of things we can go with this episode, but we'll start with how to master the way uh, we think and our, our ability to think. So with that, let's tee things up. Can you share with us? I, I know this is uh, anecdotal. There's probably no real number you can put on this. But how much of success that we have in life comes from our ability to think accurately and clearly? Okay, yeah. Well, I think uh, it has a lot of to do with yeah, how we are thinking accurately. Because I saw so many people, you know, they have, they work very hard. You know, they want to be writers or whatever, or salesmen. I don't know, they want to achieve a goal. But they never get there. Like, you know, you see them like a year later, or two years later, or mm-hmm. five years later, like, it's driving me crazy. I'm like, what are you doing? I just you need to understand how it works. You know, you need to go back to the basic of what is working, what is not working, you know. So, because you can be, you can work hard of your life if you want. But if what you do has no impact, if you have the wrong strategy, it's never going to happen. It's just never going to work. You know, I've been able to sell a lot of books. I'm very fortunate because I had this kind of strategy in mind. I say, okay, I, I can see this guy on Amazon. They are doing well. I know what they're doing. If there is a market for what I'm doing. I think I'm okay. I can be better. So if I keep doing, keep sticking to this uh, strategy I have, I will, I will get there, which I did. But many people would just, along the way, they will start starting something else. Oh, let me try this podcast interview. Or, you know, I don't know, let me start um, doing coaching. So they, they try to do too many different things at the same time. Oftentimes they have different, I guess they mix business models together, trying to Make it work, but they don't have a clear understanding of what they need to do to achieve a goal and what their goal are in the first place, I guess. So, that's, yeah, I have friends like that, you know, spend years trying to achieve goals and not working. And I'm just like, just what are you doing? Wake up. You know? <laughs> so, <laughs> it's not working. You know, Tibau, <laughs> why, why is it then? Because what you've just said makes total sense. And everyone's nodding their head as they're listening to this of, uh, understand the process hopefully model someone else who's having success in sales just copy what they're doing the best you can and 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 follow up it's easy to say but it's seemingly difficult to do so are there any uh, cognitive biases that affect our ability to just follow a plan what what stops us being able to focus on just the simple things here i don't know i think i actually don't know i think some people are just have unrealistic expectations like they for instance they feel like okay if i have a book if I spend a year or two years write a book, I'm going to sell millions of copies and I'm going to be successful, you know, or whatever. <laughs> and I had the same at the beginning, you know, uh, I thought I would have a blog, it would be so successful, I'd be making money, I would have these millions of page views or whatever. It never happened, never worked. But I think it's, it's part of the process to be able to refine your thinking, you know. It's okay to get it wrong at the beginning, but then you have to think, okay, it doesn't work out. What is working out? What am I good at? And then for me, I realized that, okay, I wrote a book. People like it. I like writing the book. I got great reviews on it. I'm making a little bit of money. I, there is a market out there. So I, I can make this happen. So I could see that. So it's based on yeah, t- testing a lot of things, getting feedback, 
and being you know smart enough, I guess, to look at what is working and what is not working. So okay, this is working. I'm going to focus on that, and I'm going to forget about that. So it's part of letting go as well of a lot of things because people want to do everything sometimes. You know, they feel like if I'm everywhere online, for instance, it's a big trap. If I have a podcast, books, coaching, a mastermind, and if I do seminars, webinars, I'm going to be successful. But it, oftentimes, it doesn't work like that. It's more like, what is the one thing that works for me? And what if I keep doing that, like 100% focus on that one thing for the next year or two years or three years? That's what I did personally. I think it's working really pretty well. But there is a risk that's, you know, what if it doesn't work? And I think it's why people are afraid of that because they're like, oh, what if, if I don't try everything and only do books writing or only do coaching, I might fail. And the answer is yes, you might fail. <laughs> but if you don't do that, you will fail. You're actually much more likely to fail. So that's kind of, you know, I guess reality in a sense. Why, so what I would say. why are we somewhat delusional? It seems like a human th trait, right? Of You mentioned there, if, if we yeah. launch a, a blog, we we, we expect yeah. in a couple of years, we can have millions of, of, of view, page <laughs> views on that. And I, I've been there myself, like projecting and building business plans and thinking that we're going to do incredible things. And yeah. for salespeople, it might be, yeah. well, I'm going to get into this new role, this new company, this product, and it's going to be easy. I'm going to crush it. And you know, yeah. a year later, reality comes around and just slaps us in the face. <laughs> Why is it that we yeah. have? Because it's clearly it's good to have high expectations and and, and big dreams. Yeah. But why? What's the, why do we? I guess a lot of the time push into this realm of it's just almost delusion. I I think we just the brain is not designed to be able to I guess uh, process. Every factor that we need to think of to succeed. We don't know many things we don't know about reality and what's going to happen in the future. So, and also it's a way, I guess, to, it's a good thing because maybe if you knew beforehand what you have to do to succeed, you will not mm. get there, you will start. Right? <laughs> so part of it, I think is actually good. And then over time, you need to realize, okay, now I need to put the work. Okay, this is, I thought I would need to, to, I would need to do that 10%. Actually, I need to do that. And that's okay. <laughs> And if you're not willing to do it because you don't have the passion or you don't have the drive or whatever, then you will fail. That's okay. And you move on to the next thing that you really want to do. So I think it's a natural process to select, I guess, people who really want to succeed. But it's very hard yeah, to, from the get-go to know, you know, to have this realistic, realistic expectations, I think. Maybe it's impossible. Sure. I, it's I part of the process. I like what you said. Two things here which I really like. One, until you get going, you don't know what you don't know. And that, that sounds, again, dead simple, um, almost counterintuitive, but that's really important. And then I love the way you framed it up as well in a positive light of if you knew how difficult it was going to be, you would have probably yeah. done something else in the first place. I think that's really um, motivating, right? <laughs> if, we're, if we're in a sales job, it's tough. You know, we've just gone through a global pandemic uh, economic crisis that could implode again at any moment. Well, if you knew all of this a few years ago, you've probably gone into... I don't know what an easier role would be, but maybe you'd gone into an easier role. So let me ask you this then. How do we know when we should quit? How do we know when we we, we, we reach a point where we've got some feedback, we, we've done this and this, and we but we're still passionate about the project, we're still passionate about getting these deals done, we're passionate about maybe not uh, selling itself, but what the, the revenue, the commissions will, will bring us. How do we know when we should go, okay, We've wasted enough time on this now. There's a cognitive bias here, I'm sure, that uh, kind of when we overinvest into things before changing and, and chopping uh, to the correct direction quicker. But how do we know when we've we've invested too much into something and we should stop and, and change tactics? It's actually, actually very hard to know. I think there's no uh, right answer, but one thing you can do is just decide, you know, like I'm going to spend three years on it or five years on it. If it doesn't work out, I'm going to quit. I'm going to, well, actually what I did is what I did three years ago. And I said, okay, I'm going to spend three years only writing books, only writing books. So every time I'm going to do something else, you know, stop, go back to writing, go back to writing, which I did hundreds of times. And if I don't get some success in three years, I will think about, I will think about what I, what's next step, basically. So I gave myself this time frame to think about it and to, to rethink. So I guess you can do that as well. Like you have a time frame. Okay, I'm going to work on this project for two or three years. If it doesn't work out, I will I will stop. I will rethink about it, and I will make a next make a decision. Yeah, and one more thing is like if you don't have any feedback 
good feedback from reality and from the world, from the customer. I mean, after three years, I guess, I don't know, that's just kind of strange, right? So for me, the way I, why I kept going is because I got this good feedback from the beginning. So I said, okay, sure. people like it, there is a market. So there's no way I could have some success. So I kept going. So I would say, yeah, have some good feedback. Make sure there's a market for it because creating a new market is possible, I guess, but it's very, very hard. No, unless you're the Elon Musk or the big guys. So have a market, know if you're good at what you're doing. Look at what feedback you're getting from your customer. Know if they are willing to pay you. Did you did you make a sale? You know, that's important because if you can make one sale, you can make 10, 100, 1,000 and more. That's also my mindset. If I can get something, do it one just one time, you know, one sale, one client. I can do it 10x, 100x, 1,000x probably. So I know there's a way for me to achieve some results. Sure. So that's uh, what I would say. Hope it makes sense. That makes total yeah. sense. So this is, it's very interesting. This is something I see in um, over at salesman.org. We've got a training program. We have a community in there and everyone's going in back and forth and chatting and there's thousands of people in there now. And something I see cropping up regularly, and and this is exa- this is the exact opposite of what you just described. Um, <laughs> I see a lot of salespeople and okay. the statistics are an, a B2B salesperson is in a sales role for uh, just around two years before they chop and change roles. Also... Okay. It takes about six months for a salesperson to, even if they are very experienced, by the time they get into a new company with new company culture, new products, new services, new markets, new customers to engage with, it takes about six months for them to be what we call ramped up and, and trained in that market. So really, in that two-year period, the salespeople that are swapping and changing are only experimenting, getting feedback, and then probably quitting or seeing that the grass is perhaps green on the other side in a different organization for a year and a half. <laughs> Yeah, which yeah. maybe that's just not long enough uh, to have success. Oh. Maybe that two, three year period is, is perhaps what we need with some of this. Yeah, what what I f- I think it's three to five years is a good time frame to 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 get some traction on anything. I think if after three years, four years, five years, there's no no growth on what you're doing, no 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 positive news, no money, nothing. Might be time to think about you no know, what you're doing wrong. Maybe maybe move on or change your strategy. Yeah. I think. Sure. And and I guess for more context here, five years seems like a long time for this. But if you split up your <laughs> your work in life uh, into three to five year chunks, you've got, say, kind of 10 to 15 goals, That's, 10 to 15 yeah. opportunities at this to find what you really want to do. And maybe you do it for 10 years, 15 years. Once you really get that feedback and you really cotton on and you, you get the uh, product market fit and all this good stuff, uh, or uh, for salespeople, the, the job kind of role fit uh, or the individual and, and job fit. So you've got multiple at bats at all of this. So it's not end of the world stuff to be able to put no. a, a, a kind of three to five yeah. year timeline on it. Yeah, and also like if you're a salesman, you're learning, right? You're learning skills. So even if you fail at making sales, you, you're, you're working on your craft like a writer. You know, working on your craft. So when you have to start again in a new industry, for instance, you already have so much knowledge on what you have to do. So it's it's faster in a sense. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. So you're, you're reducing be, those yeah. feedback loops over yeah. time. Yeah. Yeah, that makes total sense. And this, yeah. the conversation reminds me a little bit. Have you read the book? I think it's called The Dip by Seth Godin. I, I haven't read this one, yeah. Okay, I so yeah. he talks about the data and research. I'm, I'm not going to give numbers because I'll butcher it because I've not read it in years now. But what he <laughs> says is very successful people yeah. do two things. They quit the right things at the right time. And this is obvious, right? And then they stick with the things that are going to lead to success over the long term. And very few people, I mean, there might be a few uh, TikTok, TikTok stars or you know Vine back a few years ago that upload 20 videos and start earning millions. But for the mid, or people yeah, who win the lottery, yeah, but for most work. people, it's a five to 10 to 20 year period to build uh, kind of the wealth that we all perhaps aspire to to build. And so he says that the most important, well, he said the most important thing is successful people quit the wrong things early. And then just by <laughs> default of doing that, they then end up sticking to the, the right things long term. Okay, they, they, when you say they, they quit the wrong thing? They they have a rapid feedback loop. So when they find something that, when they're trying lots of things and they find that, oh, this isn't quite right, they quit. They yeah. will, if they've invested yeah, yeah. Uh, money into a training product, they just, just bin it off. It doesn't matter. They don't, um, I think, I can't remember the name of the cognitive bias, but there's a cognitive bias where once we invest into something, we will yeah, then. Yeah, yeah, uh, same cost. Some cost, yeah. uh, the some cost fallacy, the same, right? Same cost fallacy. Yeah. yeah. So. so we need to yeah, we exactly, need to avoid yeah. that. Yeah. 
Cool. All right. So if we yeah. so we're avoiding the sunk cost fallacy. Um, T. Bar, are there any other cognitive biases that tend to people get hanged up on? Yeah, I was thinking of one. The big one is um, making the assumption that because you don't like something or you don't want something or you want a product, your customer doesn't like it. And I think it's it's such a big trap. You think, oh, never assume that people are like you. Like you know, let's mm. say, I don't know. I don't, let's say I don't buy anything online. I never buy something online. doesn't mean that my customer, would, they don't want to buy something online. You know? Or I don't buy something that is worth $1,000 or more. doesn't mean that there's other people out there who want to pay $10,000 or $100,000. You know? It's just never making assumptions and just testing the market for whatever you're trying to sell. I think it's so important to yeah, avo- avoiding making as, assumptions as much as possible or being aware of what these are and working on asking, oh, is it true? And asking yourself, you know, is it true? How do we train ourselves to do this? And I'll give you an example here. So we've just got a, a new puppy. So I find myself regularly saying to my partner, she'll say X, Y, Z. And I'll, I keep saying to her, do you know that to be true? Because neither of us have had a dog before. So we don't, <laughs> you know, I, I've, read, I've read loads of books, yeah. watched loads of videos. But even when you read in a book and a video, it doesn't mean that it's, it's factual. It could still be an opinion. So I find myself uh, asking my partner regularly, do you know that to be true? That at the moment, Walter the dog is eating stones. He just loves eating stones. Apparently, this is something that golden retrievers and, and Labradors do. Um, so we've got like, kind of kind of uh, called an awful lot of the garden, and uh, we're having to like basically the garden's quite big, but we're trying to like keep him in in the, the grass area so he doesn't have access to stones. But my partner was saying, well, it's just normal. All golden and labs do it. Like I kind of just alluded to then. But I remember saying to her this morning, like, do you know that for a fact? Is is that true, what you're saying? Or is that an assumption that you've made? Now, then we went and Googled it and found that it, it is somewhat of a fact. There's multiple people that report this. But how do we, it, I feel like it's easier to point it out in someone else, but how do we train ourselves not to make assumptions? And then I guess it's two yeah. steps, make an assumption and then take action on an assumption. Um, that, that can lead to difficulties, right? Okay. Um, I think the one thing you can do is ask yourself, how can I be wrong? No, to look at, no, you tend to look at this, you know, the confirmation bias. So you look at, oh, I'm, this, I'm thinking this, so it's maybe right. So you, you look for more information to basically make you feel like good because you're right. Yeah. I'm right. <laughs> I was right. Uh, do the opposite, right? Which is, you no. Know, looking at what, how can I be, be wrong? It could be, you know, political view, religious view, anything, you know, business. You know. So asking yourself, how can you be wrong? Is, I think is a good, good start, which is hard to do because of the ego and we all want to be right. And that's a good thing about, you know, every person in the world, they think they are right. That's amazing if you think about it. Like 7 billion, 7.5 or 8 billion, they think they are right. Mm-hmm. Because otherwise, it would change something most of the time. So, and so that tells you how much of thinking is inaccurate in, in at least some way or another, right? So, so be humble about that and try to learn as much as you can by asking yourself or, or, or feedback, you know, as feedback from your customer, from your friends, from your family. How can I be wrong? I think it would be a good start. Perfect. I, I was just about to say that. Is it physically possible to do it ourselves? Or do we need a coach, mentor? Uh, do we need our sales management or sales leaders to uh, kind of interview us regularly and stay on top of this? Is it possibly, Is it possible to be so self-aware and, and diminish your ego so much that you can do this reliably? <laughs> uh, partially, I think. <laughs> I think it's, you, you, you always have blind spot. We have blind spots. It's, that's, I think that's inevitable. So we can do some work on ourselves, and as well as having, you know, a boss, a coach, a mentor, or someone that can tell you, hey, here, think about that. Maybe you're wrong here. That kind of challenge you. Especially if you're a CEO, like you really want to have a team of people like attacking you every day. Yeah. <laughs> but it's like, oh, oh, great, great. No, you're wrong here. You're wrong there. You want to have people around you that are challenging you all the time. I think it's, that's how you design a better model of reality and have better results in your business or other areas of your life. Sure. So that's what uh, I would recommend. Yeah. But that's something I see um, in more modern sales versus when I was in sales, perhaps uh, kind of seven, eight years ago, in that it's less of well, it's a few things. Sales used to be a lot more of a boys' club than what it is now, uh, a lot more like bravado and like banter. And now it's more of a, uh, not in all places, but it seems to be in the companies I'm engaging with, more of a business unit that's not so siloed off siloed off against everyone else and so they don't get away with all these shenanigans that like they used to and the customers don't want to be taken out on the golf course to, to win business anymore they, <laughs> they want to engage and have a, a consultative process right and, and and learn something in their conversations as opposed to be kind of sold at and have someone throw a pitch down their throat so some of this is disappearing but I feel like that's something that 
is perhaps happening more organically uh, cult- uh, within like companies' cultures. There's more sit-down meetings. There's more discussions. There's more. It's probably just people are scared of getting sued as well. So HR is involved in a lot more of this <laughs> stuff as well. So uh, uh, with all that said then, t about how does... Because I feel like we're, we're two dudes here, right? I'm having this conversation over Skype. And we're both in a relatively logical mindset. We're having a, a nice chat. How does uh, how does this change when emotions get involved? So it's one thing to say, yeah, just you know, ask yeah. how could this could go wrong. Do this, do this. But when you've got perhaps a customer who's screaming down the phone at you, or uh, you, perhaps your work life's going great, but your home life's falling apart, and there's other things going on then that's affecting your emotional state. How does our emotions uh, affect our kind of like view on reality? Well, I think uh, I like to say like you don't want to make a decision when you're like in a, in a bad emotional state, right? Like never make a big decision in your life when you're angry or you know or, or depressed. And, and uh, no, be be actually be kind to yourself. So, okay, I'm not feeling good now, so try to be aware of that and say, oh, I'm gonna wait. And once I'm feeling better, I mean, I, I can make decisions. So that's one tip, you know. Obviously, it's easier said than done, <laughs> and I get that because <laughs> if you're angry, you know, it is. <laughs> so that's to try to remind yourself of that, not make decisions when you're in that state of mind. Yeah. Yeah. And then you have many ways to, to start, you know, I like things like morning routine or things you can do in every day in the morning to start with a good thinking, start with meditation or think that it can help you really condition your mind every single day. So I think it's something you can do to improve your, I would say your overall emotional state, but help us also with productivity as well, because if you can be calm in the morning, you have your own time a little bit, and then you go to work, you're in a better mental state, focused, ready to work on your, you know, your big, your big task. Maybe, I don't know what you do, maybe it's cold calling or, you know, some sales uh, work. So that's a big, big part of what I do, like to do is conditioning the mind because we know we tend to have a lot of negative emotions kind of by design, just because the brain is always trying to survive you're looking for threats. And we have kind of this tendency to have a lot of negative emotions. So it's good to just train ourselves to be, to focus on the positive Things like, you know, gratitude as well is a big thing. Uh, self-compassion, always be nice to yourself. Because you're always trying to do our best, you know. You're always trying to do our best with what we have at any time, even if it doesn't seem that way from maybe someone else looking at you. <laughs> but yeah, so that's what I would say, like a few tips I could I could mention. Sure. What I can do. I, I love this idea of being kind to yourself. And I always, because that seems somewhat selfish on occasion, right? But I like to think uh, of it like yes, this. Of uh, we, uh, you, we're probably on the same wavelength here. I can't look after other people yeah. unless I'm in a good place myself. If I sort myself out first, I can then look after the dog and my, um, my, my girlfriend and stuff. But if I don't look after myself, I then I'm frustrated with them. I'm frustrated with work. I'm frustrated with the sales that we do. And so I, I totally agree with what you're saying here. Of we need to start. Um, I almost try and I almost try and keep every day as a, a clean slate. And again, a lot of this yeah, is easier said than done, right? Um, but a lot of that comes yeah. from me from having that good morning routine. So, what what does your morning routine look like? How do you how do you reset yourself if you've had like a miserable evening the day before? Well, it depends. But uh, I like to, these days. I'm just waking up, thinking of you know my I'm selling books, I'm having an impact, I'm thinking of these positive things about my business going on. I like to just take some vitamins, drink a, drink a cup of tea. So, really like to take my time because I want to be in this. You know, it's kind of brainwave that are very quiet and focused and calm. Because I realize that when we are like overstimulated, we like, you know, social media, emails, videos, all this stuff, it's very hard to focus on, on this important task you need to get done every day. Like your most important task is usually very hard, mm-hmm. very challenging mentally or you know, emotionally. And I think it's the big thing for me is to start my day with the first working on my most important task, which is right now is writing for me as a writer, obviously. So that's one of the big tip I, I really want people to do if they can, obviously. Sometimes they cannot for some reason. But calm your mind, do some meditation, some stretching or something else. Drink your tea, breathe or do whatever you want to do to calm yourself. And then you start working. I like to set my goals every day, every morning. So I'm writing down some goals for the day. And then, you know, work on that. Start working. That's what I do. And it's very good to stay focused and to get more done. Sure. So and, that's what I recommend. And just the process of having a, we call it an MIT, uh, most important task of the day. Just oh, yeah, having yeah. that alone d- resolves so much pain in, I know, my life and some of the, uh, we talked about this in the <laughs> uh, the community over at org because 
then you've got no excuse to faff around. You've got to focus. And once I find any exactly. personally, once I start doing something, all of the other nonsense falls apart. For me, the hardest part is that that moment of putting pen to paper or picking up the phone or whatever it is. Once I've done that, I'll procrastinate on that for hours. Like sometimes uh, that's that's yeah, one of yeah, my that's... kind of biggest issues. But once I start it, then you're almost in this uh, like a flow state and then you, you can carry on throughout the, the rest of the day, right? Yeah. Yeah, I think, you know, when you talk about productivity, I, I think it's, the simple things you can do, as you mentioned, is to work on your most important tasks first thing in the morning. That's the only thing you really need to do. If you can do that, well, you will only be fine. Yeah. Because then you will feel better about yourself. You'll do more stuff in the afternoon. And you know, if you do that consistently every single day, you, that's really the only thing we need to do, I think, in terms of productivity. As opposed to having all these complicated, you know, like to-do lists and software and get things done, whatever. I just, I think it's kind of pointless because unless you're really, really disciplined, then you can move up maybe to a very complex system. But I think for 99% of people, you sit down, take a piece of paper, write down your most important task, maybe three, two or three tasks every day and work on it. <laughs> yeah. And for salespeople, your most important task every day is very likely, unless you've got like a massive contract that needs work uh, to get the deal closed. It's prospecting. It is, as you said before, cold calling or it's cold emailing or it's reaching out on LinkedIn or whatever it is. Just get it done. Once, once you've done that at the beginning of the day, the rest of it's easy. Um, do you, if you were all familiar with the, uh, I think it's Brian Tracy who has the eat uh, the frog yeah. uh, metaphor. Yeah. So, eat, eat that frog, yeah. So yeah. for, for the yeah, audience who, who might not be aware, it's if you've got to, you have to eat this frog at some point during the day. Well, there's two types of people. There's people who will just eat it, get it done, and then carry on with the day as normal. Fine, they've done it. The other set of people, are, which is me, a procrastinator, will put it off until the last minute. But now you've wasted the whole day faffing around, stressing about eating this frog, and you've got to do it anyway. And you've just, you've all the other tasks that you thought you'd do before and have all been a mess and a, a muggle because you've been stressing about the frog. And then you get it done and then you do eat it at 11 o'clock at night and you're like, oh, it wasn't that bad anyway. So his, uh, uh, Brian Tracy's metaphor yeah. is just eat the damn frog, get it done. Yeah. And I think, as you said, like, uh, it's okay. Like, we all procrastinate, right? I mean, nobody, nobody is perfect. So the same thing, like, be self-compassionate. You're going to procrastinate someday. It doesn't matter. I mean, as long as you try your best every day. So for me, yeah, a big tip when it comes to emotions is really like the self-compassion part of it, which is not selfish. As you said, it's like selfless because mm -hmm. if you're in a good emotional state, you can be you know, happier, you're more productive, you're nicer with your family, nicer with your colleagues, nicer with your employees. There's so, much, so, it's just so many benefits. And it's like, you know, I, I see as a, I call it a safety net to your to your well-being, because if you don't have self-compassion, if you don't practice that every day, you're gonna get you're gonna get into depression sometimes. But if you have this kind of safety net, oh, it's okay. You know, sometimes I have a bad day, and what well, everybody's like that, and you have this kind of self-talk, it's gonna really help you move up to you know feeling better about yourself. So I think it's really important to practice that in our daily life. Amazing stuff. Well, I've got one final question for you, uh, Thibaut, and that, and that is uh, kind of going slightly off topic here, or on topic, but perhaps uh, less focused on ourselves. Is there any way to call out someone or communicate with someone when we know that they're falling into all of the traps that we talked about in this episode of? Perhaps they're slightly delusional. Perhaps they um, kind of are distorting the reality that they're living in and that's affecting us. This could be a customer who has a massive, exaggerated expectation of what our product is going to do, and then we're trying to explain with them what it can <laughs> actually do. Is there a way to communicate with in, an individual like this and, and reset their expectations? Yeah, that's a great question. <laughs> <laughs> But I wish I had the answer. <laughs> <laughs> I know it's it's so difficult, that, right? I know it's so that, my friend. I saw that around me. You know, people. You know that they. You know that they kind of uh, misalign with reality. Is basically, mm -hmm. what it is, meaning they have unrealistic expectations. Just though, I guess there's no point trying to like attack them or being angry or because it doesn't work. You know, if you try to push, maybe push again against you, right? So more like being aware, being present, being. Maybe asking some questions to make them realize something in a, in, a, you know, in a different way or sending them some documents or some readings to do. And you, oh, if you want, maybe you can check out that without forcing anything. It's maybe the best shot you have at convincing <laughs> someone. Because <laughs> I don't really know yeah, what else you can do, to be honest. Yeah. Yeah, you've, you've, you've it, it is tricky and you've described something I like to do then of this is one of the reasons why um, I like to document everything in sales conversations. So I'm, I'm, negotiate, I'm negotiating a big contract at the moment. It's the biggest contract we've ever done as salesman.org for a big uh, sponsorship deal. It's taken months to put together. Um, and 
on on the back of this, there's a few questions that have popped up now that were talked about months ago. And the, some of the people I spoke about months ago, they've obviously they've got loads of things on. They've forgotten about what we agreed. But after every conversation, I will send up a follow-up email of, this is what we talked about. This is what we agreed. Uh, and at the bottom, I'll always write, if there's something that you uh, kind of don't agree with, or I've got the wrong idea or the wrong angle or the wrong angle of this, reply to this email and let me know so that we're clear. So I like to document everything because there's a few conversations that come up now that, hey, well, we, we, we assumed this, this, and this, which is what we're talking about, right? We assumed this. Uh, our our, our um, expectation is this, which is not what we discussed. So all I have to do now is, as you described, link them to the emails that they've re not replied to and they've acknowledged in the past. And then that resets everyone's expectations and brings it all back down to the reality. Now, I might be t yeah. in living in a delusional reality myself, but at least at this point, everyone's living in my delusional reality <laughs> as opposed to everyone having their own delusional reality, which is, I guess, kind of how most of the world lives most of the time. Yeah, yes. It's because, you know, we, we come together, we cannot manage to live together because we have so many different realities that kind of, I guess, is collective intelligence or something that make it work, <laughs> right? <laughs> in a sense. Amazing. Well, with yeah, that... Yeah, you said it's... Yeah. Go on, go on. I interrupted you then. Uh, no, I mean, what you said is great about uh, expectations. Like, if you want to write everything down, say, this is what we agreed on, this is what we're going to do, this is what we promise, that's that's the best you can do and when it comes to you know, customers and this kind of relationship. Then you can come back and say, oh, you, you agreed on that. I, I sent you this email. And you can be like, oh, okay. Yeah, yeah and, and I find a lot <laughs> of people, no matter how big their egos are, will then go, oh, yes, I, I did agree on that. And then they'll just forget that they spent 20 minutes on the phone <laughs> arguing with you uh, prior. Um, cause again, we want to protect our egos. We want, I think this, there's a cognitive bias to this as well of once we agree to something, we like to then stick with that, even if there's a, a huge amount of evidence contrary to it. So if individuals agree to something over an email, then that's almost, uh, kind of ammunition to get them to agree to it in the future. Yeah. It's a lot to change. Uh, it's, uh, true. Yeah. Cool. Right. Well, with that, um, Thibaut, tell us about, cause you got like I mean, there's, there's seven books in the series. I've read um, uh, Master Your Thinking, which is what we've covered on today's episode. But tell us about the series of books and where we can find out more about yourself as well. Yeah, so I, I have actually 20 books, but I have like seven books in a series that is very successful. So I have this uh, Master Your Emotions, I have Motivation, I have Focus, I have Thinking, Destiny, uh, Beliefs, Success. I think that's it. I guess so. <laughs> yeah, so each each, uh, each book is addressing a topic. Like, for instance, focus is about uh, what we talked about, uh, avoiding the shiny object syndrome, being focused on one thing, you know, understanding your main task and all this stuff. So, yeah, so each each book is pretty practical with an action guide. They can ask, ask the same questions, write down their answer, take action. Because I like I want people to take action. That's why I write books in the first place. Because if they don't take action, it's kind of pointless. Because this knowledge you have in your mind, you know, what we don't have is knowledge. But it's only intellectual. But you have no practical wisdom and you don't know what you're talking about, which I think is a big trap to achieving success in anything. So that's, yeah, so they can check my series of books on Amazon. Just type my name, they will find me. And that's it. Yeah. Amazing stuff. Well, I'll link to the books, your your blog, everything else in the show notes to this episode over at salesman.org. And with that, I want to thank you again for joining us on the Salesman Podcast. Oh, thank you so much for having me. It was fun.